Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. Today we've got a crazy story of getting a boss to pay over $200,000. But first a story from Trap Slapper, my small company's becoming a corporate hexcape. My employer has been growing a lot in the last couple of years, from around 25 people to almost 200. The company issued earbuds I used for remote work with my phone and PC died. So I requested an exact replacement since they were comfortable for me. I was told those would be considered a personal item, but they would be more than happy to send me a new, over-the-ears headset. I bubbled this up to my supervisor and explained what I was requesting is $90, and what they were offering me was $330, thinking he would see how silly this was. He told me I would have to take the headset or buy my own earbuds. I had them mail me the headset. Meanwhile, if this would have been a year ago, I would have just ordered my new set with my company card and nobody would have said a word. But now, in order to control spending, I'm not allowed to make that purchase. My company just cost themselves $240 in the name of saving money. How much do you guys want to bet that this company had some kind of like bulk stock purchase and they probably just had these in stock and that's the reason they were forcing OP to take those? Do you think it's more likely that this company had that excess stock and was just trying to pawn one off on OP? Or do you think they were actually weirdly stubborn and spent $240 more because they have some kind of weird regulation now? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Our next story is from Jane L. Insurance companies absolutely make no sense. My son has severe cerebral palsy. He's predominantly wheelchair bound unless we put him into his stander. This is a device that we can strap him into and tilt it up into a position that has him standing instead of sitting. We use that piece of equipment with him every day for at least an hour, sometimes twice a day. It's a vital part of his daily activities. Well, because we use that stander so much, the safety belt and harness have both worn out. I put in a request to our medical equipment vendor to order us a new set of belts and harnesses so he can continue using a stander. This obviously should have been no problem as it's just a replacement part for existing equipment that our insurance has previously bought. The vendor did that, but I got a letter from the insurance denying the claim. I called Aetna to find out what was going on. The person who took the call said they no longer pay for replacement parts. For the record, the hip belt is $252, and the chess harness is $175, a mere $427 replacement order for them versus several thousand if I were to order a whole new stander. I spent an hour arguing with her about how the safety equipment is worn out and it's not safe to use it without them because he would simply fall out of it, that it's vital to its use to have those items. She suggested I pay for them out of pocket. And again, she reiterated that the policy no longer covers replacement parts for equipment. A light bulb finally flipped on in my head. I asked if I were to order a whole new stander, will my policy cover it? She said yes. So that's exactly what I've done. I emailed via my chart to my son's PMR doctor requesting the prescription for a new stander to be sent to the vendor. At the vendor appointment, we got squeezed in two weeks later. I told them what all happened on the phone call with Aetna. Both the therapist and the vendor's rep at the appointment busted out laughing. My son now has a pending order for a brand new Lecky stander with a motorized hydraulic lifting system, new activity tray, and all the safety harnesses and belts, including extra thigh supports for an approximate total of $5,900 for all these bells and whistles. Three days ago, I got a call from the equipment vendor telling me that the order's been approved and the equipment is being ordered from the manufacturer. I expect to have it delivered in a few more weeks depending on logistics. Thanks, Aetna. I only wanted a $252 hip belt and a $175 chest harness, but will gladly use a whole new standard that Aetna has to pay at 100% because our yearly deductible's been met due to his medical condition. So Aetna has to pay almost $6,000 instead of $425. I plan on donating the other stander, which is only four and a half years old, to Shriners Hospital. Hopefully one of their patients can benefit from it. For literally all the times American insurance companies try to screw over people, you almost go forward with this action with a huge smile on your face, especially after getting a notification that it's been approved. They give you a hard time about replacement parts, and then they just go and upgrade you to like the ultra super deluxe model? Sure. 
By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Our next story is from Prodigy Lee. You won't fix the system issue since it only affects one site? Okay. Keeping my job details vague, so sorry if it's plain. I work for a US company that has many distribution sites physically all around the world. The company uses a system that connects us all to the same database. The database holds all the safety information for our products. All documents are automatically updated by the system every few years. When major adjustments to a product is made, or when someone requests for an update. I often do this manually with most products I work with to ensure that all information is as fresh as possible. What happened? I was retrieving safety information to cross-reference for a product when I'd found an error in the system. The product had been marked to be a much more dangerous classification than it really is. This error would cause shipping issues as well as issues for customers. I sent support tickets and was told that I was the sole person slash site having this issue as all the other sites had old revisions which did not contain the error. They weren't going to look into the issue, as it was too much work for one site. If it affected many sites, then they'd look into it. Okay. I shared an idea with my supervisor, and they gave me the go-ahead. I pulled up the product on the system and refreshed it for everyone. Now, the incorrect classification affects everyone else too. Over the next few days, I watched the support system get flooded with the same complaint, to the point they had to release a mass email internally to report that they're dealing with the issue. I got a pat on my back from the supervisor and an apology from the support team in the end. I don't blame OP for doing what they did one bit when you're literally told, sorry, you're only one person, we're not going to help you out at all, and then following that up with basically, but if you can spread this around and infect enough other people, We'll probably do something about it. What are you left to do? Tell them to make it a problem for everybody else so you don't get totally tanked because you're just one site. This next story is from Dodgeball Water. Malicious Software Code Review Way back in the early 2000s, I found myself working freelance as a result of the dot-com implosion. I found a gig subcontracting for a contract a large company in San Diego had acquired from another company. They wanted to build a reliable delivery platform for the cell network. In those days, cell data was 2G and 2.5G at best, so this wasn't as easy as you might think. The division of the large company ran a satellite message platform, and the CTO of that division had no interest in this project, which is how I ended up with it. Interestingly enough, in the dot-com implosion, I'd been let go by a company building a van overlay on the internet, a very similar problem. Since the second version of a product is always better, I just took the lessons I learned and applied them to this project. That included heavily relying on this new thing called open source software. It took my small team about six months to build and deliver the platform, and both the customer and the salespeople were very happy with the result. But the CTO of this division was not. He had turned down the project based on his assumption that it would be a long and arduous task. So he demanded a code review with me and my team. He was very explicit. He wanted to see every line of code in this project and we were to not leave anything out. He was sure we were somehow faking our results and was going to get to the bottom of this as there was no way we could have delivered in six months. So we assembled our source into a zip for him. First the code we wrote, then all the source for the open source libraries we used, then the source for the libraries those libraries used, and so on recursively until everything. We ran all that through a formatter to make it easier to read, and ended up with about 800 megabytes of source files, which we sent that off to the CTO. The initial code review date got moved back and rescheduled for a month later. We sat in the meeting, waiting for him, and he arrived about 15 minutes late. He stood in the doorway and looked at us and finally asked his only question, what did we use to pretty print the source? I started to say that we used a script, we wrote, but he cut me off, said fine, and left the room. We ended up doing work for that large company for 10 years, and never again were we asked to a code review. What I love about this story is it's just full of people knowing exactly what they need to do to get an otherwise seemingly hard job done. OP had valuable experience in this before, knew exactly what they needed to do. 
came in, got the libraries, got everything done, and all it did was upstage the one person who thought it just wasn't doable in that amount of time. And our final story of the day is from Bright Rick. Boss did not like the look of the bulk mailing stamp, told me to remove it. Cost the company over $220,000. Back in the 1980s, I worked for a sporting goods company as a catalog designer. Small company, privately owned. I was the entire advertising department. I created four catalogs a year. These were responsible for most of our mail order sales, pre-internet, to the tune of around $700,000 a year. We sent the catalogs via bulk mail using a mailing service. This let us send them for a much discounted rate. To do this required the use of a bulk mail permit, and placing the permit info on the mailing area of the catalog. Technically it's called a fiche. Enter a new boss, call him Ron. I was number one, the only one in my department. For some reason, the company owner hired Ron as a favor to a friend. From day one, he was micromanaging, questioning everything, and screwing up my very tight schedule. This was before computers were common. Everything was by hand. Literally typing out copy and reducing it on a photocopier to fit. Developing the photo film myself, making prints, etc. The actual printer had to add screens to the photos so they'd print, burn metal plates, and so on. All time consuming and expensive. Deadlines could not be missed. So I was stuck with several 16 hour days come crunch time. I was complaining to the owner, but he couldn't really care less. I really wanted to stick it to Ron and the opportunity presented itself. Constant threats of my way or you're fired were getting to me. The latest pre-summer catalog was done. Summer was our big season. I had to give him my mock-up, photocopied sheets stapled together, of the final catalog for his approval. A new step after he demanded it. He looked at it and sent it back with several pointless revisions. And a note to remove that ugly permit box because it was not needed. Where we worked previously, they stuffed their mailers in envelopes. The envelopes had the fiche, but their mailer did this last step. I simply asked him to initial the changes as this was the final approved version and was going to the printer the next day. There was no time to check it again. So he did. I knew it would be a total mess and it's something I would never have done in the past. 50,000 catalogs printed and shipped directly to the mailer. The day they arrive at the mailer, the boss gets a call from the sales rep. We can't mail your catalogs. Boss storms into my area of the building and is literally screaming. Ron is now pissed and yelling at me, joined by the boss. I swear, spittle and froth, vain, bulging, screaming. Minimum two week delay, wasted money, lost sales. I explained what happened, the threat to fire me, and showed the owner the changes to the final copy, initialed by Ron. He was going to give Ron a second chance, until the bill came in from the printer. They had to stamp 50,000 catalogs by hand. We had to rent their permit, since that's what's on their stamp. Rental and labor was almost $8,000. Adjusted for inflation, that's $20,000. Plus, our early summer sales boost was off by almost $50,000 from previous years, or $200,000 adjusted for inflation. Ron was fired. I was left alone after that. Honestly, from start to end, this whole story is so disappointing to hear about. OP is nailing their job, a one-man band that's doing everything right, and some nepotism hire comes in and is totally just trying to, like save face or look like they're doing something, and not only creating issues in the process of getting the catalog out, like just being a general headache, but in the end they screwed up big time. Do you think, considering OP knew just how bad this could come back to bite the company, that willfully choosing not to mention it to their boss was a pretty big no-no? Even though Ron was threatening them, signing off on things, telling them they should do this, Should OP have gone to the boss and blown that whistle over this situation? Or despite a huge price tag, do you think OP was totally justified? I'd like to know what you guys think. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. If you want to hear another malicious compliance story that was crazier than any of the ones in this video, click on that left video. 
Or if you missed my latest video, click on the right. But with that said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.